And, um, and speaking of which, why don't we go ahead and, and just pray and ask God just to uh, have mercy on us in this election and also for God to open up his word to us this morning. So, Father, we thank you that you are sovereign over all things. And as we face a very contentious election, Lord, a nation very divided, uh, very concerning, Lord, when you say that a house divided can't stand. Lord, I pray you bring unity back to our nation. I pray you bring restoration, God. I pray you send revival to your church. And I pray, God, that you send a spirit of conviction and evangelism among the lost. And that you, Lord, would sovereignly lead this election where you want it to go. God, you know what your plan is. You, we know what's going to be happening in the last days, but we don't know the timing. And whether or not you choose, Lord, to continue to hold back the world unity that the enemy, Lord, that Satan wants to do in the last days, or whether or not you want to break down that wall and just move forward, we have hope either way, because our hope is in you, and we're looking for you, Lord, and trusting in you. And I just pray you would, again, send a spirit of peace to our cities. I say, I pray, God, that you would just send a spirit of peace to the heart of your children, believers. And Lord, that we again would just rest in our God regardless of what happens. And Lord, now as we turn our eyes to your word this morning and look at you giving your message to the church, your messages to the church, God, your correction, your instruction, your evaluation. There's so many things we could call this. But Lord, we pray that you would speak to us individually because it wasn't just for the church 2,000 years ago. It is for us today. And I pray you'd speak to each heart from each of these churches about what you're saying to your churches today. And Lord, give us an ear to hear. And so we open up ourselves now, God, to you. Pour out your spirit and do what you want among your people this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. As we get today into the seven churches, now we're only going to cover four churches today. We'll get the next, the last three next week, and I think it's quite daunting already to cover four. There's so much I would love to talk about in these, and that's why I encourage you to go online to hear the full study that we did a few years back, more in-depth study, uh, looking at the churches and all that goes with it. Either pastormarkkirk.com or on our website or any number of great teachers that are out there that work through the book of Revelation. It's very, very uh, helpful in understanding not only the Bible, but the last days and what's happening. But but as we look at the seven churches today, there's some groundwork we need to lay before we jump into them. And that is this. This is Jesus' message to the church, but it's also his evaluation of the church. And you'll notice there's seven churches. The number seven in Scripture is the number of completion. And so what God is going to be doing here, what Jesus is doing, he's speaking to all of his church. And it's not just his church 2,000 years ago, as we said in the prayer. It's his church today. And what do I mean by that? This is God's word. It's alive and breathing. And you're going to find that all seven of these churches, they were literal churches that existed back then. But you're going to find that all of these seven churches exist in the world today. If you go back and look at churches around America, around the world, you'll find there's a church that fits in all these categories. There are churches that are being faithful, churches being unfaithful, churches that are stumbling, churches that are corrupt. All these things are there. Five out of the seven churches... The Lord has something good to say, and then he gets into what they need to work on, and then of two of them, he has nothing good to say. And what a sad place to be in that state. What we want to do is say, God, which church are we? And we know where we want to be. Now, where we want to be, we won't get to until next week, and that is the faithful church, the church of Philadelphia, which even then we want to, again, we're not satisfied with where we are. God has to work in all the churches, and again, we hopefully that's where we are, and if we're not there working in that direction, I wouldn't be so boastful to say that we don't have our issues, but we have to be open and say, God, what do you want to change at Calvary Chapel in Knoxville? What do you want to change in our lives individually? What do you want to say to us? And so understand when he writes this, he's writing it to literal churches in that day, but they're also representation of the church as a whole throughout history. And by the way, speaking of that, as we look back now historically, we find out that the way the Holy Spirit wrote this, it's even prophetic. That is, each church era is represented by these seven churches. In the first church today, we'll get into Ephesus. That was the early church. That was the first church. That was the one that was the most on fire, but began to lose their love for the Lord. Then we move into the church of Smyrna. That is the church that came under great persecution. Then we move into the church of Pergamos, and we begin to see the church becoming kind of like the world, move on into church of Thyatira and becoming completely corrupt. And it'll work all the way through as to where the church went through different eras of church history. And if you look back at church history, it lines up perfectly with these seven churches. And that's why most theologians believe it's also prophetic. And I'm not a theologian, but I agree with them that this is prophetic of God's uh, work in church, in the church throughout history as well. 
There's another thing to realize about this, and that is you're going to see that uh, the, this church, again, the churches here were specifically laid out on a specific male route in the Roman day, and that is we'll start with Ephesus, and as you work around the churches, that's the way the Roman mailman would run which I think is really cool because they would drop off the letters and move the letters from one church to the next as God wrote these letters to the churches. All the churches read the letters eventually. They were circulated, but they would be given to these initial churches or these, uh, these churches initially that God was specifically writing to them so they could hear what the correction was. Now, there's also something else. I love the way God does this, and we can learn from this when it comes to counseling. I think this is really important for a pastor. It's very important for anybody in counseling ministry, and it's really important for you when you're ministering to your friends and trying to encourage them in the Word. They come to you and they say, hey, I've got this issue. What's going on? Or maybe even something you see in their life you need to correct. And he lays out a principle here because in all of these churches, what you're going to see the Lord do, except for those he can't say anything good about, he starts off in every one of these telling them something good that they're doing. Hey, I noticed you're doing this. You're doing that. You're doing that. That is great. Way to go. However, we have an issue. Great wisdom when it comes to counseling. You're speaking to someone or maybe a brother or sister that you need to kind of talk about because you see something in their life that's not consistent with, you know they're living a way they shouldn't live. You want to, listen, there's a reason the saying a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down, right? Because the principle is, is you want to be kind and loving and try to encourage and then say, now let's talk about some other issues. So there's wisdom here in the way we counsel as well. Hold on to that wisdom. Lastly, before we jump into this, um, again, as we see the Lord addressing each of these churches, you're going to find that he addresses them with a very specific introduction that comes out of chapter 1. That is when the Lord revealed himself to John in chapter 1, he gave all these descriptors of who he was. I'm the one who holds the seven stars. I walk among the lampstands of the churches. I have eyes of fire. I've got feet of brass. I've got, he talks about all these descriptors that he had in chapter 1. And then what he does is he comes to each of these churches and, and takes the phrase that best applies to them and deals with it. What is my point for us? The Lord meets us where we are. And he this morning is going to meet you where you are. If you need a spoonful of sugar and a little bit of maybe encouragement afterwards, that it's not quite as fun, he'll give you a lot of sugar this morning. He'll encourage you to say, no, but you know you need to deal with that. If you're just really in rebellion, he won't give as much sugar. He's going to come in and say, you know what? Stop it. He'll be more direct. And we're going to see the churches that he's dealing with very specifically in his personality. Wherever we are, that's where he meets us. And so, again, having an open heart to the Lord and saying, God, do in me whatever you want. Say to me whatever you want. There's going to be a much more gentle approach. If we're stubborn in our heart, he'll come in and hit us more firmly. And it might be by something he says this morning. It might be by something that happens in your life. It might be someone else in your life that says something and you realize, oh, my goodness, why'd they say that? That's straight from God. Nobody could have known that. And you might not even tell him, but you walk away convicted. He'll meet us where we are. And he meets these seven churches where they are because he loves us. He wants us to be more like him. He wants us to grow and he wants us to be corrected. And so let's jump into this now. Chapter two is we kind of have this groundwork laid for the Lord now speaking to his churches throughout time at the moment of every generation. And then what he's going to say individually to our hearts this morning. Notice what he says. He first comes to the church of Ephesus. He says to the angel of the church of Ephesus. Again, remember, this was the early church, the one that was on fire at the beginning. And in one generation, we're going to see they veered off course. He says, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now there's his introduction from chapter one. What he's saying is, I hold the stars. Remember, we identified the, the, the messengers, if you will, the stars being the, the pastors of the churches. It literally, the angel of the church, when it says that, literally is the word messenger. And again, because of the context, the Lord is speaking to the pastors of the churches. And he's saying, hey, I'm speaking to you and I hold the pastors in my right hand. That's a comforting thing to know. And he said, I walk in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. That is representative of his spirit in the body of Christ. So what he's saying is, okay, pastor and church of Ephesus, I'm walking among you in my spirit and I'm going to say some things about you, but you need to listen up and you need to respond because if you don't, there's going to be consequences. So there's a warning here, but there's an encouragement. And as I said, first of all, he starts out with an encouragement, again, to this loveless church because they started out on fire. But again, it's interesting, one generation, by the way, quick note, it doesn't take but one generation for a people to fall away from the Lord whether it be your kids or whether it be a nation. 
if we don't train the next generation up, they can fall away. And what's interesting in the wording here when he talks to the Ephesians, it gives a picture here of when he talks about them kind of falling away. Not that they just chose to walk away from God and to lose the love that they had. It was a slow drift that they barely even recognized until it was too late. It would be, imagine this, you, you tie up your boat, you've got the romantic picnic, right? And you tie your boat up because you just rowed in with your sweetie and you dropped it off and you go and you go to get a, put the bank, put down your blanket, get all your stuff out for your picnic, but you didn't tie your boat down. Because the lake looks very calm. I mean, it's barely moving, right? And you enjoy each other's company so much that you're not even paying attention. An hour later, you look up and your boat's out in the middle of the lake, just kind of barely floating up. Oh my goodness, now what? Well, now you got to get wet. You got to jump in, go get it and bring it back. You didn't intend for your boat to float away. But because you weren't paying attention, because you didn't keep it tied in the spot it should have been, it's gone. That's the picture of the church of Ephesus. And it might be the picture of some of us this morning and where our hearts are. Maybe right now we're realizing, you know what? You're kind of speaking about me. I'm not really where I need it. I mean, I haven't walked away, but I, I, I guess I have drifted. I guess I'm not really where I used to be. And so it's time to come back. He says, I know your works. Again, here comes the sugar, right? I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. So you're doing good things. You're doing good works for me. You're working for me. You're very patient in the things of the Lord. You're standing against those that are evil. You're speaking the truth in the pulpit and among your people, regardless of what's around you. And he says, look at this. You've tested those who say they're apostles and are not, and you found them liars. Now, about apostles. We have an office of the prophet and we have a gift of prophecy. We have, I think, an office of an apostle and the gift of apostleship. And what do I mean by that? There aren't any office, office of a prophet such as Elijah's, Ezekiel's. They don't exist today. Why? Because they were needed before the Holy Spirit was given. Now every one of you have a prophet inside of you. He's called the Holy Spirit. You don't need some man to be the one that hears from God to tell you what God's saying. The Word of God tells you that. God will use pastors as they teach, but God can say it straight to your heart. So the office, if you will, the official position of a prophet is no longer needed. And Jesus himself confirmed that. He said, the law and the prophets were until John. He said, John was the last official prophet. And John was the greatest prophet that ever lived. However, the Bible speaks of a gift of prophecy in the New Testament. God still works through a gift of prophecy. It's just not the office of a prophet. Now, the Bible talks about the 12 apostles. And how do we know they're the official 12 that are, are the recognized apostles? Because when we get to the end of Revelation and we see the foundation of the new Jerusalem, guess whose names are written on the 12 foundations of the new Jerusalem? The names of the 12 apostles. Not 50 apostles, not 100, not 1,000, the 12. They're the ones written there. So there's a recognition that these have a specific a position that others don't have. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't with those with the gift of apostleship. And what do I mean by that? Because the Bible talks about that in the New Testament. The word apostle means sent one. And when you see somebody with that gift, it's typically the kind of person that travels around a lot from church to church, encouraging the body of Christ as they move around giving messages to different churches. I think Gail Irwin's a good example of that. Those of you that know Gail, he's not doing a lot now as he's gotten older, but he would travel around from church to church and he was sent, I believe, by the Lord to go and give messages to different churches. That's where that kind of apostleship comes in. And yet what was happening in this day was you had a lot of people traveling around claiming they were all apostles. And they would show up and use the word apostle as a way to get to your pocketbook. Oh, you, hey, I need a good meal tonight. I need a place to stay tonight. I'm an apostle. Let's take up an offering for my ministry, right? And so when that would happen, again, he said, you guys are recognizing these guys. You're recognizing that they're not real. You're recognizing they're phonies. You're very perceptive. So look at all the good things about them. You're working hard. You're patient. You're, you're doing all this. You see things. You've got programs for everything. This would be the church. The parking lot was full every Sunday. I mean, you couldn't, you're just coming in with your camel. You can't find one, right? There's not a spot where I get my camel in here filled with camels, right? everybody's going to service, right? Because you couldn't get in. And you have to be thinking from the outside, now that's a happening church. And God is saying, you are doing a lot of things right. You are. He says, also, look at this, you've, pers you've persevered and you've had patience and you've labored for my namesake and you've not become weary. Way to go. Encouragement. Nevertheless, and this is where God will speak to our hearts this morning. God will tell us, you're doing this, you're doing that. Hey, great, you're in fellowship today. Hey, you're doing this, you're reading your word, you're praying. Nevertheless, are you really living for me? Are you allowing things in you should? Where's your heart for me? Do you desire me as much? Notice, here's their problem. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Notice they didn't lose it. They didn't lose their first love. They left it. 
And it's a picture of that neglect, of that drifting away. I don't think that even that they intended to do it, it just kind of happened. And notice the Lord didn't do it. They did it. They left. And it's the first love. He's saying, look, you're doing all these great works for the ministry. That's super. I love it. But it's about me. I want a relationship with you. I'm convinced that the Lord would rather have us sitting at his feet like Mary, loving him, hearing his word, having a relationship, than being all about the kitchen of the church, doing everything that needs to be done, busy, 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 busy. Okay, that's great. But Martha, calm down. It needs to, you know, get her done. I get that, right? You need to do it. But this is what matters to me, the relationship, the intimacy. And see, here's what he's saying. You've lost that. Quit quit being so busy and get up early and just sit with me. Open my word and read my love letter to you. And let's share hearts together. Tell me your needs. Tell me what you're worried about. Give me your emotions. I want that. I want to hear it. I want to share in spirit with you. Do that. He's saying, that's what really matters to me. So he goes to the church and says, look, I don't care about all these things. I will get my work done, God will say, on the earth. Without you, without Calvary Knoxville, God will get his work done. Without any church in the world, God will get his work done. He's just allowing us to be a part of that work, which is a privilege. But he says, so don't worry so much about that. He said, just love me. And I'll love you. And as we love each other, you're going to see the work get done. Because motivation out of passion and love is much stronger than that of works and forced to do it. We don't do it because we have to. We do it because we get to. What an honor to love the Lord and to serve him. And so he's like, you've left. Now, the Lord would never tell us what has happened if he didn't tell us a way to fix it. And now in the next sentence, he tells us exactly how to fix it. Verse 5, he says, remember, therefore, from where you've fallen. Repent and do the first works. Notice that. Three things I want you to note here. If, you're, if you feel this morning God's saying to you, you've left your first love. You've let your heart grow cold. You're not really spending time with me anymore. You're busy. Maybe you're even involved in ministry, but there's no connection. It's like the relationship in marriage where everybody's doing their part. The dishes are getting done. The clothes are being done. The job's being worked at. The bills are being paid. But I don't know you anymore. What happened? We used to, couldn't, we couldn't do anything, but... It had to be together all the time. We talked for hours. We lived our life. Listen, all of us go through different phases of marriage. This happens to everyone. I think God allows that to give us a picture of what happens oftentimes as the believer with him. God is saying, hey, remember when we used to hang out all the time and we would talk forever and ever. We did everything together. You never went anywhere without your Bible and you were worshiping all the time. Where'd you go? I'm still here. I want you back. And here's how you do it. He said, number one, remember. There's there's three words I want you to note here. He says, remember, repent, and redo. Now he says do. I'm adding redo to help you remember it. Remember what it used to be like. You remember when you first met the Lord, how exciting? I'm forgiven. I get to go to heaven, all these things. He said, meditate on that for a while. He said, then look at your life, how you're not doing it, and repent. Turn back to start doing that again. And he said, once you do that, Now, once you've done those two things, do the third thing, redo. Do what you used to do. Start reading your Bible again. Start praying again. Start worshiping again. Start getting involved in serving again. He says, let's kindle this relationship. Let's make this fire burn. God can revive it. God can restore our relationship to him. God can restore marriage. God can restore. If we say, I need you, God, my heart's dead. It's hardened. You've got to do a work. God will come and do that. And so he's saying to them, this plea from from our heavenly husband to the church, do that. But then he gives the bad news or else I will come to you quickly and I'll remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. His lampstand is the presence of his spirit. In chapter one, we see he said the lampstands were among the churches, the seven churches. It represents the Lord fueled by the oil of the Holy Spirit, lighting the church on fire and lighting our way. He says, if you keep in a state of of non-love, if you you don't restore to me, he said, I just can't stay in that. I'm going to back away. And I don't think this is talking about a loss of salvation. That's not the point here. That's a whole other theological issue. This is just talking about him backing away saying, the intimacy's gone. The close relationship is gone. And I'm going to remove that lamp if you don't respond. Serious warning. I told you, God gives the sugar, but then he gives the, you know, the, 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 the shot as well, you know, of, of healing of what we need. 
He says, but this you have. Now, I love this because now it gives some more encouragement, kind of this encouragement sandwich here. You got the encouragement at the beginning, kind of the, the bad news in the middle, and there at the end, some more encouragement. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which you also hate. This is interesting because Nico means to rule over. And, and most believe it has to do with the pastors or those ruling over the church. And the laity, laetans comes from laity, which means the people. And when we look up what the deeds of the Nicolaitans were, this is where, again, it was beginning right here. It gets stronger as the church goes on, where the pastors and or the priests and or the leaders of the church start becoming an, a go-between between God and his people. God says, I don't want any go-betweens. I died on the cross and I tore that veil top to bottom so that anybody could come to me anytime and they don't have to go through anybody to get to me. And he said, I hate it. When somebody tells you they've got to go through you to get to that person, God says it more than once in these churches. I mean, there's not a lot of things that God hates. He said that, I hate it. It would be like our kids wanting to get to us. And some adults between us and our kids saying, you can't talk to your parents. Do you just tell me what you want to know and I'll be the one that tells them everything. What? Grab that guy by the scruff and throw him out the back door. That's my child and I'm their father. Don't you get between us, nobody. Again, one mediator between God and man. And that's the man Christ Jesus. He said, I hate that. Verse seven, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is the midst of the paradise of the garden. There's a little bit of a thing that makes it more lively for the Ephesians because this is where the Diana's temple was, which is one of the seven wonders of the world. And her symbol was a tree. There was a lot of environmental worship that went on. And her symbol was a tree, nature, okay? And so he said, hey, I have the tree of life. That's the tree of death. You come to me, I'll give you the tree of life. That was in the, it's in the midst of the paradise of God. Same tree, isn't it kind of cool to know the same tree that was in the Garden of Eden when the Lord comes back, there's gonna be a, the, the tree of life here on the earth. We'll be able to partake of that when the Lord comes back. What's that gonna be like? I don't know, I'm gonna love it. But it's gonna be great, whatever it is, because it's a, it's, a, it's a privilege to be able to do it. And so the loveless church, he deals with them. Now he comes to the next church in that male route, if you will, the persecuted church, the church of Smyrna. And again, the church historically, uh, the second church period where persecution kicked in. This is where as the church began to fall away and that first love began to fall away, uh, Nero raised up, the emperor of Rome, Domitian raised up, another emperor of Rome. And between the two of them killed some 6 million Christians during this era of time. So imagine if you were during this church period, this is the persecution church period. This is the crushing to the angel or the messenger of the church of Smyrna. Smyrna is where we get myrrh. Myrrh was an anointing for the dead. When Jesus, you know, they gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It represented his kingliness. It represented his fragrance of beauty. And the myrrh, the fact that he was going to die and resurrect. And the Lord's going to talk about death and resurrection. He's going to say, I know you're being killed. By the millions, I know you're dying. He said, but you trust in me. You put your hope in me. I'll take care of you. He says, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. Bam, there it is. The myrrh, the death coming back to life. He's taking out from chapter one and giving the introduction they need to hear. And the way you would get myrrh is by crushing it. You would crush it and get the oil of the myrrh that way. And he goes, I know you're being crushed. I know many of you are dying. I know this is happening, but I was crushed. And I died, but I resurrected to him who was dead and is now alive, to him who's the first and the last. He goes, that's me here. So this is the description. You have hope as well. I know your works. Now he gives him the good news again. I know your works, your tribulation and poverty. That isn't necessarily good news, but the works are. But you are rich. Again, why did they have poverty? Because this is also during this time where the Roman leaders started calling themselves gods. Again, a picture of the revived Roman Empire where this Antichrist is going to say that he's God. And you had to go and pinch incense. You'd pinch it and drop it on an altar to, to the Roman emperor. If you didn't do that, you couldn't get a good job. So many of them were losing their livelihoods, losing their money because a Christian can't do that. He says, I know your poverty. I know the tribulation you're going through. I went through that as well. He says, but you're rich. Why? Because you know me and you have the riches of heaven waiting. I know the blasphemy of those who say they're Jews and are not, but are really a synagogue of Satan. Again, the Jews were also jumping on the Christians during this church period. Why? Because the Jews were accepted among Rome. The Jews weren't accepted religion. Rome left them alone. Christianity was not. And so they gave them a hard time and the Jews joined in. He goes, these aren't my real followers. They're a synagogue of Satan. I know about them as well. Do not fear any of these things which you're about to suffer. 
And this isn't the best news right here, but God gives them grace. Notice this. Indeed, the devil's about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you'll have tribulation for 10 days. Again, 10 is the number of divine order. That means God has a certain set time that he's going to allow us to suffer and no longer. He says, be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. If you just stay faithful to me through all this persecution, you'll have the kingdom waiting on you and I will reward you for the suffering that you went through. Don't lose heart. There may be death, but there is definitely resurrection. There may be crushing but there's going to be joy and there's going to be life. He says, be faithful. And by the way, before I even finish this, I want to say this. You might be thinking, and I think this way, Lord, I thank you that we're not in a day like that in America. Other places are. How would I handle that? How would I handle knowing I was going to be put to death for my faith if I went to some other country and they arrested me for being a Christian or if something changed here in America? Here's what I'm convinced of. This is not just me saying I believe it, but when I go back and read the martyrs, and if you've ever read Fox's book of martyrs, it's a great book to read. There's some other martyrdom books out there. You will find that with all the believers that were being put to death for their faith that we have recorded, there was always joy at the time of their death. I don't understand it. It's supernatural. It was just something God did. And when you read about it, they'd be fearful, even a week before, even a day before. I remember reading about one that was, he was going to be burned to death and he was putting his finger in the, in the candle in his cell going, ah, I can't handle this. How will I let my whole body handle this? And he was almost panicked. And God gave him rest and peace and joy. And by the next day, he was rejoicing in the Lord, trusting in God. Many of them died singing, giving praises. Listen, this is not some self-determination. I'm going to do this. I'm going to really shine bright for Jesus. It is supernatural grace that was given to them because they're made of the same stuff we are, which means if we ever face that persecution, and I don't think we will, but if we did, the Lord would give us the grace to go through it with joy. I believe that because knowing what he's going to do, even, even just the, getting us through the, 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 even the painful part, I think that God even releases that from the things I've read. It's really amazing. Be faithful, he says, unto death. Verse 11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And that neat? What he's saying is this. Everybody that's been born will die once. You know, there's this whole discussion about, you know, when we die or if you're going to die, or we're all going to die. You know, 10 out of every 10 die. That's just the news, all right? But the bottom line is, is that even though that takes place, if you're a believer, you'll only die once and then you live forever. If you're an unbeliever, you die twice. What do you mean, Mark? Here's what I mean. You'll die once physically, but then your spirit will be eternally separated from God and his glory for all of eternity if you don't receive Christ before that first death. And so he says, blessed are those who overcome. They'll not go to the second death. That is, they're going to be true believers and give their life to the Lord. Make sure that you're one that only dies once. And that comes by giving your life to Christ. Notice the compromising church. He comes now to the third church. This is, again, in church history. This was the days of Constantine, right after all the persecution of Nero and Domitian. Constantine comes along a little bit later, shortly after that, and Constantine sees this vision in the sky, he says, of a cross. And he hears a voice that says, conquer in this sign. So he goes to conquer. He defeats and takes over the empire as the new emperor. And he says, hey, because I heard conquering this sign and because I saw a cross, I believe that the God of the cross wants to be the God of the whole Roman empire. So we're now going to all be Christians. Well, that's good and bad. All the Christians were like, great. All the persecution of us being put to death is suddenly gone. And now we're, all, we're, we're in. We're the in group. And everybody's trying to join them because they want to be pleasing to the emperor and pleasing to Rome. The bad news is all the people that didn't really know the Lord wanted to be in with Rome as well. So guess what they did? They joined the church. And now you have, when I say bad news, certainly you want the world coming in if they're coming in to receive. But if they're coming in bringing the world with them and they have no intention of repenting, you've got a real problem. You've got a church now that is forced, unless they make a strong stand, into compromise. And that's what was happening here. The world was coming in, wanting to be a part of the church here during the Pergamos time period and literally in the Pergamos region. And so he says to the angel of the church of Pergamos, right? These things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. Notice again what he uses for his intro here, the word of God. It's not just a sword that's sharpened on one side. It's sharpened on both sides, so it cuts both ways. It can be used back and forth. It can be used in and out. It's going to be, he says, I'm going to send my word very firmly, very tough, curtly, if you will, if you don't repent and respond to this because you're compromising. Stop the compromise. And listen, I told you we see a little bit of all these churches in the church today. Do you see a little bit of Pergamos in the Church of America today? You do because the church is compromising. 
It's not just that the church is now saying, you know what? We used to see what the world was doing is, and we would call it out or say, look, we're not going to stand there. Now we're bringing it into the church and saying, not only is it okay, we're going to make our leadership involved in those sins. This was the sin of the church of Pergamos. So God now sends his sharp two-edged sword. I know your works, where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. How would you like to live in a town where God says that's where Satan set up camp? That's his home. By the way, there was a big throne built there to Zeus, who's, who's known, it was known as the Savior God, kind of in competition to Jesus Christ. They found that throne years back, and they actually took the foundation of it up, moved it over to, to Germany. It's in Germany now. They, they rebuilt on top of it a model, and the real one's in a museum over there. And again, this is where Satan's throne was. This is where a lot of demonic activity was happening in that day. I don't know where Satan's throne is today. I have some thoughts. You wonder if it's North Korea. You look at some of the areas that are the darkest in the world. I don't know. But it was here at this time. And he says, you hold fast to my name and you did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr. Again, history tells us Antipas was killed on that altar to Zeus right there at the front of it. Who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. So there, here's my news now. There it is. First of all, I know the works you're doing. I know you have a hard time. He gives a little bit of encouragement. But now comes the part, okay, we've got to deal with some things. He says, I have a few things against you because you have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to stumble, uh, the, to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. You remember Balaam. Balaam was the prophet, the Gentile prophet in that day that Balak, the king, hired to try to curse the children of Israel before they came into the land of Israel. And every time he tried to curse them, a blessing came out. And finally, he said, I can't bless them. God won't. He said, I can't curse them. God won't let me. I can only bless them. He said, but I know how they can, how they can curse themselves. He said, get them involved in worshiping idols and sexual activity before marriage and outside of marriage, and God will judge them. I won't have to curse them. They will curse themselves. So he sent them in with all their men into the women and the false idols. They got involved in sexual activity outside of marriage. And God began to judge them and had to judge the nation of Israel again, which God judged Balaam and Balak for doing that. But at the same time, God's people also got judged. But notice he said, here's what, Balak, uh, what ba Balaam did. He caused them to, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Uh, it was built into the false god worship of that day. Thus you have also those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, he keeps mentioning that, Repent or else I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. I'm going to speak the word of God in a powerful, cutting way if you don't repent, and I'm going to cut you off. You need to repent. No more compromise. Listen, the world's going to do what the world's going to do, and we need to love the world. And we need to, listen, when the world comes to church, we need to love the world in the church. Maybe you're here today and you don't know the Lord. Maybe you're here today and maybe some of the things the world does or the way that it's accepted in our society, the Bible says it's wrong, and you might know that it's wrong, but you don't think it's that bad. We love you, and you're welcome. But we have to let you know the Bible says if you live that way, you can't go to heaven. That's what true love is, being honest. Oh, that's so harsh. Don't talk so harsh, Pastor. You'll run people away. The Lord said, I will send a double-edged sword. It'll cut both ways because I love you that much. If you don't repent, you're not getting in. Powerful. A lot of people reject it. They run from the double-edged sword. Some people receive it and go, ouch. But I know it's true. Lord Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me. I come to you. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I'll give some of the hidden manna. I love that, to eat. And I'll give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except the one who receives it. Manna represents the Word of God in Scripture, the bread of life. He says, if you'll be faithful to me, and you'll repent of these things, and get rid of the compromise in the church, and the compromise in your personal life, and walk according to my Word in holiness again, I'll show you things in the Bible nobody else is seeing. I'll give you hidden manna. I'll blow you away. I will excite you about what's going to be happening in the future. I'll show you things prophetically. I'll show you things as how you're going to live in the future. All this I'll give to you. Hidden matter that other people won't get. It's a beautiful gift that the Lord promises to give if we do that and a new name. Again, I love the new name because whenever you have someone you love, you always give them new names. And you think about you know, your boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, and maybe with your wife and all that, you know, a lot of times, you know, you have a nicknames for them. Your kids, you know, you have nicknames for them and, and, and you can call them that nickname and they just accept it as normal. Somebody else calls them that, you know, it's kind of like, what are you calling me that for? That's kind of weird. But your dad, you can call him all kinds of silly names, you know, Abby Dab, you know, or Lee Ellie or whatever it might be. I have little names because I love them, you know, and I have, I have pet names for them. Even your dog, you do that with, right? You give your dog pet names. He says, I'm going to give you a new name. 
Now, I doubt it's Buki or something like that. I don't think so. I think it's probably, probably something more majestic than that. But still, isn't that exciting? And he comes to the last church now, the corrupt church. This was the church of Thyatira. Again, a church of that day, but also in church history. This is where, again, we began to see the church getting involved in idols and very heavily in the priesthood. This is just a historic fact. And God now writes to this era, if you will, of how he feels about that. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like fine brass. Now, once again, he identifies how he's approaching them. Eyes of fire, I see right through what you're doing. My eyes pierce, and I see what's happening. I see the sin. I see what's happening behind the scenes. And not only that, I'm wearing feet of fine brass. Remember, brass in Scripture is the medal of judgment. He's saying, I'm coming to judge you. Judgment begins at the house of God. And I, I see this. And if you don't repent, I will be judging you. And I'm going to deal with it. And God will in his time. And he warns them he's going to. He says, I know your works. Now, again, once again, like all the other churches, he mentions what they're doing right at the beginning. I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, your patience. And as for your works, they're more than the first. The last, rather, are more than the first. You're doing more than even when you began. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. So he addresses now what they need to deal with. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. It, probably not a specific woman really named Jezebel, but that spirit. Remember, Jezebel was, a, 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 was married to King Ahab up in the northern kingdom. She came from a family of witchcraft and pagan worshipers and all that and brought it into Israel. And she was corrupting the entire nation up there in corruption. He says, you've allowed that corruption now to come into the church. And he said, you're accepting sexual immorality. Look, you're, you're telling people, yeah, it's okay. You know, you really love each other. You can move in together. That's okay. God will accept that. God won't. He won't. He'll deal with that. God will judge that if you're a true believer. You may think you're getting away with something, not because he's mean, because he loves us. And this is the hard message again. He says, don't allow this corruption to come in. They were bringing it into the church. They were accepting it as normal. Just, it's okay, bring all these things in. And again, this is fearful for the church to me in our day because much of the church is saying, you know what? It's okay to have all these idols in your worship. It's okay to have the sexual immorality. No biggie, don't worry about it. And God says, no, this is the spirit of Jezebel. This is wicked before God. He says, I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. There's his piercing eyes of fire, searching the minds and hearts. And again, his brass feet bringing in the judgment if they don't repent. And I'll give to each one according to your works. Now I say to you and the rest of Thyatira, now he ends with encouragement again. As many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan as they say, that is, again, there was a whole serpent worship going on there in Thyatira they called the depths of Satan. He said, if you've stayed away from that and, and been clean in that, I'll put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. Just if you're walking with God in the midst of the corrupt church, hold on to what's not corrupt and you stay righteous. You stay pure until I come. And he who overcomes, that is those who makes it through and doesn't get corrupt like everyone else and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Remember he said we're going to rule the nations with Jesus Christ. And now he pulls out a messianic verse that talks about when Jesus rules the earth during those thousand years, this is how he'll do it. Speaking of Jesus, it says, he shall rule them with a rod of iron and they shall be dashed to pieces like a potter's vessel. That is those who don't walk in line with God's commandments and his word. And it says you're going to be ruling with him as I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. The Bible tells us another name for Jesus is the morning star. He says, if you'll be faithful, I'll give you me. Are you kidding? I get you if I'm faithful? Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. What better gift could there be than Jesus saying, I give myself to you? Beautiful. He who has an ear that is spiritually listening, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Guys, as we wrap up these first four churches, again, let's challenge ourselves this morning. Are, do we fall in the category of the loveless church? Now, I'm speaking, yes, I can include Calvary as a whole in any of these, but also I want to bring this down to individuals. I want us to challenge ourselves in heart. Has our love grown cold? Is it not like it used to be? Do we need to repent and redo? Do we need to cry out to God and ask for God to restore what it used to be like? If so, then you need to pray that today. 
What about the persecuted church? Maybe some of you are being persecuted. You're being, you're just crushed at the fact your family has rejected you and your friends have rejected you and maybe at work they've rejected you. He says, I know what that's like. I was crushed as well. Be faithful. From the crushing comes something beautiful. He said, I'll give you the crown of life if you hang, it, hang in there. Or maybe compromising. Maybe this morning God says, you know what? There's something you're compromising in your life about and you need to deal with it today. Stop it. You know that it's wrong. Quit making excuses for it and acting like it's okay. It's not okay. I want you to walk in holiness with me so it doesn't hinder our relationship. And lastly, the corrupt church, is there anything that is in our life this morning that is corrupt? You know, I had, sometimes my computer will act a little bit weird. I guess they all do. And I've got this malware thing, right? And you hit that button and it goes in there. Those of you that have a Mac, it does that. If you have a PC, you have some other virus thing. But it does a scan. And as it scans, it looks at everything. You see all these numbers going, all the scanning. It's like, oop, oh, corrupted file. Quarantine, boom. Scan, scan, oh, corrupted file, boom. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the face of the whole earth. Again, seeking those that he can show himself strong through. He, they scan. This morning, God, God's spirit is scanning us. His spirit is scanning our hearts. The question is, when God scans, does he see any corrupt files? And if God shows you a corrupt file this morning in your spiritual software, it's time to quarantine it. It's time to take it to the Lord in prayer and say, God, this can't be there. It's, it's going to ruin my entire makeup. It's going to ruin everything here in my hard drive of life. I need you to clean me. I need you to wash this out and do away with it. And that's what we need to pray this morning is for God to rid us of all these things. So let's pray for all these things for our church as a whole. And let's pray for us individually. Let's pray. Lord, I, I just bring all these things before you this morning. I thank you for showing us all the different types of churches, all the things that every church should be warned about, as this is all encompassing, Lord. This is your church, the number of completion in all these churches. And so this morning, if there's any of us here, Lord, and we see that our heart has grown hard and crusty, God, that we would remember and we would repent and we would redo the first works. God, revive us and restore that love relationship. Do it as a church and do it for us individually. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone this morning that is walking now in the persecuted church, whether it be family, whether it be coworkers, whether it be friends, they're being crushed and maybe even feel like they're dying this morning. Lord, you're the God of resurrection. Help them to be faithful to the end and you will give them fresh life. Lord, for those that may feel like this morning you've convicted us of compromise, maybe we know we're doing something we shouldn't do, let us deal with it this morning. God, as you reveal and show any compromise we have in our life, Lord, remove it. Take it out of the way. There's just no place for it, no room for it. And help us to repent and turn from that that we can walk holy. And Lord, that we can be pure for you Lord, nothing muddying the waters that we drink from and that you look at from heaven. And Lord, lastly, if there's anything corrupt here at Calvary Chapel, Knoxville, show us. If we've got some corrupt files, we want to deal with it. And God, on an individual level, if there's anybody in here that has some corrupt files before heaven, God, reveal it. Let your piercing gaze get right to it but let your love overwhelm. Lord, you said all we have to do is turn it over to you and turn away from it. You will cleanse us, you will remove it, and you will restore us to proper function for, before the kingdom. Lord, I thank you for the work of your spirit this morning. Thank you, Lord God, for all you've done. I just pray you let this transform us. Let us leave this place different than we came in. And thank you, Lord, for your mercy and love to be so loving that you would not just tell us the good news, but tell us the, the bad news as well so we can be purified and holy before your throne. Father, we thank you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.